This is about humans dreaming together. About humans supporting each other on our journeys. It's about the science and the art behind making our dream lives a reality. To the students of life. The young and the curious. The dreamers and the doers. To those who crave to be a strong individual. And want to be part of something bigger than themselves. Welcome. 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 Welcome to the Dreamology Podcast. Welcome to the Dreamology Podcast, everyone. Dreamology is the study of the art and the science behind making our dream lives a reality. And on this show, we are focused on giving you the mindset, tools, and strategies for making daily progress towards your dreams, no matter where you are in your journey. My name is Tim Bishop. I am the co-founder of the Dreamers Initiative, a student of life, and a life conversation junkie who is on a mission to identify how to truly live the dream life and help you do the same. The guests on this show include best-selling authors, neuroscientists, entrepreneurs, and just dream chasers out in the world who share their knowledge, greatest stories, and life lessons with us. And before we dig in, I want to mention this podcast is brought to us by The Dreamers Initiative, a personal development community for helping Gen Z and millennials awaken their dream life and make them a reality. We believe humans are stronger together and that together we can accomplish anything. Let's get started on today's episode. Today's guest is an inspiration engineer, a TEDx speaker, formerly homeless, former musician, now thriving entrepreneur, personal brander, marketer, salesman, Kave. Kave shares in this interview a lot of his stories around forming his identity, around forming his career, and around really using suffering as a tool for growth and suffering as a tool for figuring out who you are and building character in your life. And so, I don't want to waste any more time. I want to get right to this interview. Here is Kave. I'm, I'm grateful to be here. I'm excited to talk about the story and the journey. Let's let's rock it out. <laughs> let's get it, dude. Let's get it. Well, man, I got to tell you, yesterday I watched your TEDx talk back from 2018. Mm. And uh, I just want to start there because there was a quote that like hit me. I was like, oh, wow. And the, mm. uh, the quote was, uh, there is growth and death and there is no in between. And then you kind of pause and I was like, okay, he's trying to, he's trying to build some suspense. And I loved it, man. I want you to talk about that quote and uh, why you, why you said it like that. Mm, mm, facts. So the way I look at life is either, and I got that from Tony Robbins. That's, that's the first person I heard say it, where he said, you're either growing or you're, you're dying. There is no, you know, standing still. There is no being stagnant. Mm. So when you have been around a lot of growth minded people, and starting out in my life, it was not that, right? Like I was around a lot of naysayers and people that just, you know, don't believe in possibilities and people that really have stopped growing, right? And For so sure. from my experience, that's what it's been is either you're either con- consistently growing spiritually, physically, mentally, emotionally, or you're, you've, you've parked and you're just mm. going the opposite direction. So that's, that's really what that quote was uh, in reference to. Yeah. So what's the, I'm going to play devil's advocate because I agree with you, but I'm going to just play devil's advocate for a bit just to have some fun here. All right. You know, what is, what's the biggest harms or the disadvantages would you say of, of just not having a growth mindset? Like, you know, if someone said, I don't feel like I'm dying, what, you know, what would be, what would be a response to that? Well, first off, spiritually salvation, if you believe in that type of thing, like that's deep, Mm -hmm. like it don't get no more deep than that. If somebody is a Christian or, you know, what have you, but uh, in in the natural of things, if someone wants to just be a couch potato and watch TV and get fat, I mean, to each his own, I'm not judging (laughs) that lifestyle, right? Like that's not for me to judge, but I think that the majority of people would say that they either want or desire a life that they can be happy, they can be fulfilled, they can have joy, and they can have peace. So if you want those four things, then you're best served to be on the growth side. But again, you know, if somebody wants to, hey, you just want to eat potato chips and pretzels <laughs> and, and chow down, do your thing. You know, that's, that would be my, my thoughts on that. Yeah, word. Okay, cool. And in the, yeah, in the talk as well, too, I remember you mentioned 
and I'm super interested in this too, because you already had a conversation with someone who kind of mentioned this too, which is that, you know, we fantasize and we idolize people like Tony Robbins and Gary Vee. And, uh, you know, you said the dangers is, is thinking that these people are perfect and that they're not going through their own, you know, versions of, of what am I trying to figure out? And I kind of want you to elaborate on that because I thought that was a super powerful point. Yeah, that's a powerful question I haven't gotten. I love that question. So there's a guy that I follow that I know who charges 22000 uh, uh, a speech, we'll say. Uh, he's worked with Oprah Winfrey, President Obama, all these big people. He's got 5,000 followers on Instagram. You would never know this yeah. dude is <laughs> killing it, right? So you can't always look at the exterior of what's going on and think, okay, this is what I'm going to do. So for example, I'm going to give you another example. For sure. I've noticed that you've got trendsetters, right? And then it's like everybody else follows along. Now, I'm not dissing nobody. I'm just speaking truth. Yeah. I got a, and when I say truth, it's true from my experience. That's what makes it true. So the first person I saw pushing text was Gary Vee, right? Then after that, I saw Lewis House pushing, like, join my text blast. Then I got yeah. an email you know, from Eric Thomas, like, push my, now he's pushing text. Like, yeah. everybody's not doing it. So what I see is the leaders that set the trends, Everybody else sees it happening. It's like, let me try that or let me use that. What I tell a lot of people that I've found, and this comes from my days in music, which is how I began, That's you know, true. in the hip hop world, we talk about sampling, right? So if you're a beat maker, you sample songs and you put it in your songs. If you're trying to find your voice as an artist, like I used to sound like Nelly and then I went to R. Kelly and then I went to all these <laughs> different people to figure out who I am. I don't think there's anything wrong with you know, sampling to kind of get your, you know, feet wet or figuring out where you fit in the picture if you don't know. Like I said, try to be as raw as Gary Vee. Try to be, thank God it's Monday, you know, Eric <laughs> Thomas. Try to be you know, like, like whatever it is that you want to add in these different people, try it. But don't use that as like, this is the way it works for them, so it's going to work for me this way, right? Sure. And I just want to, I want to hit home on this. Every single person is is one out of 10 million sperm facts and <laughs> nobody else has your dna facts so since you are one out of however many people there are in the world seven billion or however many people there are now you're one and only so bring your uniqueness to to life bring your uniqueness to what you do and that's going to help you stand out competitively so like i said there's too many people i think they're they're watching what these people say and even gary v talks about how Everybody was watching Steve Jobs, and because he was an asshole, basically, they figured, well, I, I'm going to be an asshole as an entrepreneur. <laughs> talk about that. That's yeah. what I said. Like, you got to figure out what works for you and not look to these people as, like, you know, godlike or, or they're, like, you know, alien or something. And, and yeah, I mean, that's yeah. Your Eric Thomas impression was great. <laughs> no, I mean, I did a little. I wish you know, people I, listening I, could see could see the see the the arm <laughs> flailing. <in> yeah, the... <laughs> it's like you know, you've got to you've got to until you have figured out what works for you, you've got to master other people's levels of mastery, and that's just <laughs> what sure. it is, right? For you sure. got to study the greats, you got to implement what they're doing until you find your voice. Yeah. But I encourage everybody to pursue to find their own. Their yeah. Own. And I love that, dude. That's something I've been thinking about a lot in my life, right? I mean, I'm 23 years old. I'm just starting. And it's like you use these people who are doing incredible things as, as inspiration, as motivation, as, as, ops, as, or as avenues for learning, right? You can take the 40 years of Tony Robbins' knowledge and I can sit down and I can pull from all that, right? But then you got to figure out, like you said, who that, you know, who is that you? Because those guys are all great because they found out, like, I feel like their thing, right? And and what makes them tick and what their voice is. So the idea of like comparing and thinking one's better than the other is, is I feel where the poor mindset comes in, but usually it's like inspiration and motivation. And then you attack that and find your own on it. Like, I think that's, that's an awesome message that you're, you're sending there, dude. Well, um, I got I got to throw one more thing out there since you got that Jersey on right now. That yes, sir. Me. I don't know if you've seen that side by side with Kobe Bryant and Michael Jordan. Right, he's doing the exact move that Michael yep. Jordan is doing, like, the fade, the, the fade away, and everything. Yeah, and so, some might argue that Kobe did it better than Michael, eighty-one points. You know how he retired, so on and so forth. So I just say that to say, I mean, everybody's doing that. You know, studying somebody before them and and mastering that, but nobody plays like LeBron. So I just say, you know, <laughs> encourage everybody bring your own, you know, bring your own game to. Yeah, to yeah. 
you're a LeBron guy. All right, we can still be friends, but yeah. we'll, we'll have to get past <laughs> like, that. that. Right, right, we'll have right. to get past that. <laughs> cool, man. Well, you brought up music. Let's go. Let's go there because I know that's where you started, man. That yeah. was like your first. Uh, that was your first love, man. Talk to me about how the the interest in music came into your life. Yeah. So uh, I always talk about my dad would give me these hero speeches when I was like, you know, fifth grade, sixth grade. I was already writing poetry at that time. And my dad's like, you know, son, you can do what you want to do. You can be anything you want to be. Like anything you set your mind to, like, is yours, right? And so we had a family member that was one of those people we hear about who writes a, a song and a celebrity steals that song and you never hear about the original record. Like you hear the, the famous version. So my very first mentor was that. So we went over to their house just to visit and you know i'm a little kid i'm like sixth grade seventh grade and he's like you know want to hang out big cousin little cousin i was like all right cool he's like come back in my room i got a studio back there and i'm like studio like what's that right so i'm i'm back in this room and i'm like hitting the bat the pads <laughs> and the buttons and i'm like making sounds and i'm putting like poetry you know to these sounds it wasn't even music at the time like it's just mm -hmm. it's just noise right but yeah. i'm just like loving that and so uh, speaking of basketball i was playing basketball with my dad outside on the driveway. I'm like seventh grade and I was like, dad, dad, I figured out what I want to do in my life. And he's excited. He's like, what son? Like, what do you want to do? What do you want to be? I was like, I'm going to be a musician. My dad's like, nah, like <laughs> negative. Like you can't do that. And so my dad was my biggest enemy in that way. He was like, I, I say he gives me the gift of ferocity because it was like, I was on a mission to prove him wrong. So coming from Indiana, you're from Minnesota, we're both Midwest boys. Uh, in Indiana, in this little small town, I was famous, I was locally famous. And we sold out 1,209 tickets when I was 18 years old for my senior government project. And it was crazy, it was crazy. So like having that kind of experience and like w what's interesting is A, you know, being famous at such a young age and having the ego piece play in and then the second piece was my parents being there at the concert hearing 1200 people shouting for their son they still didn't want me to do music like they still were like nah and so mm -hmm. it's just really interesting so yeah like i just fell in love like i didn't have any sales skills back then all i knew was i love this and i want to share it with other people and yeah. that's what i did and this is pre myspace and social media so <laughs> it went viral and other people you know were as excited about it as i was yeah yeah so what do you do man and what do you do like we talk about society not approving of our decisions or parents or friends or i mean like what do you do when your dad your own father says i don't want you to do that like what's what's i mean a lot of people out there might feel those kind of pressures right those yeah. same pressures like i mean your course of action was motivation it sounds like it almost like motivated you but you know what does somebody do in that situation yeah i think that First off, what I've learned over time is that you cannot go to a person who's overweight and obese and say, hey, how do you get six pack of abs, right? You just, they're just, they don't know. If they knew they would have a six pack of abs, they wouldn't be overweight and obese, right? So that's right. number one. So first off, the, the dream life or the success life or whatever success is to you, since we were talking about that as far as uh, the journey and how that goes, the person who you're talking to do they embody the, the core values or the things that you want in your life? That's the first thing that I think mm. we need to assess as to how valid is this information. Now, granted, I want to make sure that this is clear and not just, you know, throw my dad basically under the bus. I mean, this is for all parents. This is for all coaches. This is for all mentors who are successful. Let's not forget, since we're talking about Gary Vee, Gary Vee passed up on Uber three times. So even the greats may not see an opportunity in you or in me or in this team or whatever it is. So the first thing is, I think you've got to, if you're going to the marketplace, whoever that marketplace represents, and you're going there for validation, there's, there's, there's two different types of validation, right? So if we're talking about an MVP, which means minimum viable product, you need to go out to at least a thousand people and say like, so we're talking about music, is this song good? Is my art good? Is this app I'm making good? Like you need to do that kind of feedback regardless, right? Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is along that way, as you're testing, experimenting, figuring it out, getting feedback, if somebody comes up to you and they're like, yo, um, you know, Tim, uh, the, the, this extraordinary podcast is, is lame, drop it. 
and it's somebody you 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 respect, you're not gonna listen to it. You're like, this is what I love to do. Like, that's cool. Like, that's cool. And so that I think there's a certain element of a, you know, do you love what you're doing? B, if someone is giving you feedback, and what I heard Will Smith say, and this is something I heard um actually recently on the Bad Boys 3 tour, uh, since we were talking about that on Instagram. Yeah. He said, uh, he said what he found was no amount of success for his parents told him he shouldn't act and all that as well. He said, no amount of success that I've had, and this is Will Smith, has made that little boy feel more secure. And I said, wow, that's <laughs> powerful. So think about that, right? That's somebody way farther along than Cave giving, giving us that nugget. So ultimately, that's what I'm saying. You cannot go to other people that are not living their dreams and let's throw one more piece of data out there. We're talking about the top 5%, the top 7%. So that's basically going to be five out of 100 people, right? Seven out of 100 people that are maybe going to say, Tim, you got this, or Kave, you can do whatever you're going to do. Because the majority of people are giving you feedback based on their experience in life. And so if they're bitter and they're not living an abundant, lovingly, you know, fulfilled, joyful, peaceful life, they're not going to be able to tell you how to take your dream and live that life. So not saying you don't want to listen. I just would say you want to listen to your heart more than you want to listen to someone's feedback, whether you should or you should not. And I'm yeah. going to there if yeah. that makes sense. Dude, that was incredible. I, yeah, that was, that was an awesome, uh, awesome response. I, my big takeaway is just like, yeah, like who are you, who are you trying to, to follow, I guess? And as a person who's giving you this advice, like do they understand your context? And if they don't, I think Gary Vee says that too. If I don't have the full context, I'm like, F him. Like, you know, it's like, he's not literally saying like, screw that person. But he's saying like, don't give their opinion a lot of validation because they don't understand what you're trying to do, what you're trying to build. So I love, I love that dude. That was awesome. It's just an opinion. That's the thing. Is it's just an opinion. Now, if you get, now here's the thing though. <laughs> I want to say something. <laughs> now, Play you devil's advocate that, here. <laughs> well, yeah. If you get a thousand people and 900 of those people said that's not good. Now you want to listen to that. That's different, right? <laughs> right? Now it's like, okay, if 900 people are saying the same thing or, you know, you got hundreds of people that are saying the same thing, then you do want to look at that feedback because sure. the data now speaks. It's not just one person that's, that's saying one thing. Um, but like I said, there's, it's a case by case scenario. It depends on what it is. It depends on what you're validating and it depends on if it's something that you love to do. Yeah, so like that, I just don't think it's a blanket answer, but hopefully for that, sure. that for helps sure. out with that. Yeah, no, that was good. That was good. So, so you decided to to continue pursuing going back to the music career. Now, let's go back to the the next step here. You have the big concert. Yeah. Your parents come. They still don't want you to do it. You go off to college, right? And then what was the what was the evolution of kind of that career as in, as in music? I know you kind of it's evolved over time, but. Um, what was that next step then? You know, what was your goal? Who'd you want to be like? Who was your, <laughs> who was the dude you were chasing? And, and how did, you know, how did things end up playing out uh, throughout the next couple of years? Yeah. So at that time, I wasn't really chasing an individual. I was chasing money. And so and by that, what I mean by that is a lot of people in hip hop and in rap, especially like 50 Cent came out that year, your Jay-Z's, your Little Wayne's, um, you know, there's been a lot of Master P was like a big name for that, uh, sold drugs to get capital. And then they use that capital to invest into their career. And so I don't knock that if somebody out there is a D-boy or a drug, you know, affiliate or whatever. That just wasn't my lane. Like that wasn't the lane that I was going to take um, just because I was so passionate about you know, you don't sell drugs, you offer drugs. Like those are two different <laughs> things, right? Like you offer drugs, you don't got to sell that. Like, you know, I mean, that's just a whole nother con concept. But anyway, <laughs> I think it was like, <clears throat> I want, um, you know, I need $30,000, right? And so that first concert, I didn't get paid because it was a school project, but the school made 10 grand easy, right? So now I was like, all right, I'm going to do it bigger and better. Like that was my mindset. I'm going to do it bigger. I'm going to do it better. And I'm going to, we're going to kill it. Like that's where I was at. So I went to uh, Ball State University and did the exact same thing that worked for me in high school. Got the word out. Like when kids would log on to their student portal to like even log in and access their classes. Like my face was at the bottom of the, of the website, <laughs> which had never been done before by a student, not like with a frat or a sorority or something like that, some kind of organization. 
and uh, you know the paper came down and covered it. This time, the auditorium is now 3,300, right? So we did heavy on the promo, had dancers, had lights, had movie screens drop down. I mean, it was a crazy show. How many tickets would you guesstimate, Tim, that we sold? <laughs> now, this is 45 minutes away from my hometown, mind you. Man, I don't know if I'm supposed to guess high or low here. but mm, That's why it's a trick I'll, question. I'll say like... <laughs> Sold like a thousand tickets. Mm, if only we sold <laughs> <laughs> we sold three hundred and thirty three tickets, right? Out of thirty three hundred tickets. Mm. Now here's the interesting piece, right? Three hundred and thirty three tickets actually was where depression set in for me. Like it was the very first seat. I didn't know I was depressed. I actually dropped out of school a week later, right? Like mm. it was crazy. But three hundred and thirty three <laughs> tickets, though. I'm in Austin, Texas now. So all those bars and venues downtown, that's a sellout. And that's a line like wrapped around. Yeah, I was going to say, that's a <laughs> That's huge. Yeah. yeah. So my ego didn't even process that that was a win. My ego uh. processed that as a loss. And so every day I would go to school, go to class. And people, because like I said, you couldn't go to class without seeing, seeing me, right? So people would always walk up to me like, how was the show? And I was like, you should have F and K. Like I was so bitter. I was so hurt. And I, I was like, I'm, I'm done. So I, I dropped out of school a week later. Uh, fast forward the story from uh, 2005 to 2013. I was working for a lot of corporations, basically mastering like sales and, and uh, what success looked like at like Google, University of Phoenix and all these different um, organizations. Uh, while I was doing that, I was running events like on the side. So, you know, now, you know, since you asked me about the inspiration engineer at the beginning, mm -hmm. at 2010, I helped a lady get her associate's degree. Her name was Melissa Briscoe. And 2010, that was the biggest win that I had had, like mentoring her to get that accomplishment compared to that concert I did in high school. So that was where I was like, man, wow. Like, wow how, many years, yeah. how many years after was that? That's uh, so that's eight, eight years after okay. that, like okay. as far as like a major win. Um, and from there, you know, I read a book called um, Awaken the Giant Within by Tony Robbins. And I started getting into like the entrepreneurialism track. And what I noticed was to build an entrepreneur brand or to build a technology, it was the same exact process that a musician goes through to build a brand. But the infrastructure, the ecosystem, the economy, works way more in favor of an entrepreneur than it works for a musician. Mm -hmm. And so long story short to run it all the way through to the end of its track, since you asked me like how did it evolve and what happened to it, that old brand died. I couldn't figure out like how to make it work. I was making money, but not enough to really sustain it. I was doing a lot of events, bringing out, you know, 75 to 133 people on average. And it was just so much work. And I was like a one man band, like doing everything. I didn't have any leadership skills or business skills. I wasn't studying like, business or anything like that and so anyway I just got burned out and I was like I can't do this um, and that was the end of that brand um, which was artistic uh, r-t-i-s-t-i-c and then music came back in my life because I was <laughs> like music is the thing that I love you know it was my first love and it's something that I love and now music is a part of the inspiration engineering because it's one piece of content that we put out that nobody else can duplicate you can't you can you can remix my record right you can sing and try to sound like me tim or you can rap like me but it ain't gonna sound like <laughs> hey, me. i don't know if so, i can rap like you dude <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so then it's come back and it's now we just released our first single called uh, give it time uh it's now in uh, 300 stores worldwide um not to go into this sales pitch type deal but just sharing uh and it's all about like music that programs you you know now we're we're programming you musically lyrically with dope beats, right? Yeah. And then we got the coaching and all the other resources behind yeah. it. So that's, that's yeah. how it fully evolved. Damn, crazy. Yeah, so talk to me. Let's get a little backstory around the inspiration engineer because I know mm -hmm. based off of kind of what the research I did on you was that, you know, there was almost like, you know, you saw that a lot of times in life people say you have to choose this, you have to choose this, you have to do this. But you were, you know, picking up these skills from, you know, music to then entrepreneurship and sales. And you said like, like, why can't I like combine these things? Why can't I bring these things out in this like inspiration I engineer concept was sort of birthed. Can you talk to me about the, the origin story of that phrase and what it means to you? Yeah. So two things. So first off, uh, a really 
like dope quote that I want everybody to write down, you know, wind it back, listen to it again. <laughs> is a Ralph Waldo Emerson quote. He says, um, as to methods, there may be a million and something. He says, but the man, and I'm going to add or woman, but the man or woman that can successfully grasp the principle may successfully select his or her own methods. So as to methods, there may be a million out there, but the man or woman that can grasp the principle can select the method in which he, he uses or she uses. So with, when I heard that, when I read that, I was like, I got it. And so the, the, I used to tell people, um, uh, I guess I got to back up from there. <laughs> Cause I was going to say two things. So, um, there's a saying from the legends, uh, you know, the Zig Ziglar, the Jim Rohns and all these philosophies that you study. They said, uh, if you want to be more valuable to the marketplace, have more skills, which is, is true. Right. But the more skills you have, <laughs> the more confusing the marketplace is by what you do. Okay. So if you speak, English, Italian, Spanish, and French, and somebody's like, what languages do you speak? You tell them nobody's confused. Well, skills don't work like that. If your skills don't all fall under the same umbrella, right, then people get confused. So um, at that time, right, I was a poet, songwriter, audio engineer, rapper, singer. I was a salesperson, marketer, event coordinator. Um, there's probably some other ones that I'm not even thinking of, right? right? So I was all these different, th oh, and I did design, and I still do some design work. So I was doing all these different things, and what would happen would be I would go to Chamber of Commerce, and I, like when I'm around uh, small business owners, I was a salesperson. When I was around artists, you know, I was an audio engineer, musician, singer, whatever, songwriter. When I was around entrepreneurs, I was an entrepreneur and a marketer, and I just felt like, dude, I am like lying to people. Like I am so <laughs> inauthentic right now. Like I am just like, I don't like this. Like I'm a different like persona to different people. And mm. so I was like, okay, I got to find something that works for me to where I can not be society was trying to put me in this box. And I was like, I don't want to be in this box. <laughs> right. And by this time I had already, you know, coached a student and helped him break six figures in revenue. I had that uh, mentor track record of, of the uh, Melissa that I told you about the associate degree. So I had had this experience of like also being this coach. And so I was like, man, I need something that can really fit for it all. Mm -hmm. and, and when I say it, 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 it like you can play with it. So before Inspiration Engineer came out, I would tell people, uh, imagine if Tony Robbins and Michael Jackson made a baby. I'm the baby. Like, that's what I would say, right? And hey, that's would, a big, those are big names to live up to. Those are big names. Exactly. <laughs> hey, I'm with it. I'm with it. Big visions. So uh, that's what I would say. And, you know, people would chuckle about 87% of the time. So from there, I was like, well, I need a title. So I came up with 10 titles. Uh, Inspiration Engineer was one of them and not my favorite. I don't even remember what the other ones were. Mm -hmm. uh, but I took them to my community. And I was like, you know, I need y'all's help. Like, this is the problem that I'm facing. This is what's happening. I need y'all to tell me what I am. So they took the 10, they narrowed it down to five. They took the five, narrowed it down to two. And then they eventually chose Inspiration Engineer. And Inspiration Engineer was... And it's important. stuck. It's stuck. Dude, I feel that so much. Like, whenever I'm filling out like documents or tax forms or whatever, like they'd say like, what kind of business is your business? And it's like, is it in sales? Is it in wholesaling? Is it? And I'm like, yeah, you know, none of these boxes fit like what I'm, <laughs> what I'm doing here. Like none of this, none of this works. Like, I don't know. I'll just check one, but this is not the proper box. It's, 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 it reminds me of also when we have those like ethnicity boxes too. It's like, if it doesn't have mix, like it's, it's got all these boxes, like yeah. and you're like, well, I'm not really that or that you got to like, yeah, you know, society has this way of, they have these rules. That's what I found. Society has rules and uh, you know, all Schwarzenegger, I, I wish I could do my, my Arnold voice right now, but you know, he says, you know, <laughs> don't, don't break the law, break the rules. Break the rules. And if you look at it from uh, an SEO standpoint, which is search engine optimization of standing out. So like Tim Bishop, not to knock you right now, this is in love and in support of, <laughs> of you right now. If you go with Tim Bishop, Timothy Bishop, there's probably thousands of Timothy Bishops out there, right? If you yeah. use your middle name, whatever that is, um, Tim Blank Bishop, that might separate you from the other Tim Blank right. Bishops. But right. even that might be common. So the other way to separate yourself competitively is to come up with a unique title that makes sense. And you'll start seeing more and more of these because a lot of people are doing it to give themselves differentiation. But that was how Inspiration sure. Engineer blossomed. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I know that 
the name Tim doesn't give me any SEO, uh, <laughs> SEO favors. Well, dude, I like, you know, I like the creation of the inspiration engineer for a few reasons for yourself. I think it's cool. But when you talk about like an impact or legacy sort of thing, you know, like I think most people would be the people who would see something and then, you know, try to see, you know, follow a path or, you know, it's, it's hard for a lot of people to just kind of create a new, a new path. But when somebody does, then a wave of people can follow. So like you talked about Gary Vee, right? Doing text, everyone else does text. Uh, who is the first guy? Carl Lewis, who ran the four minute mile. Uh, and then everyone else runs a four minute mile after, right? So right. by you creating an inspiration engineer, the concept of you can combine the things that you are and make it into you. Now you're creating, I feel like that's kind of me too, but you're creating this, this avenue. Like it's a, Hey, it's okay for you to do this for so many people, even though they don't need that. They don't need that, but it's going to help. I guarantee it. Absolutely. And I want to, I want to throw one more thing out there. Cause I was asked of like, can other people be inspiration engineers? I was also asked before, like, you know, at what point should you craft your title? Right. Or what, yeah. at what point? Yeah. And I, I want to address those two things. I think that, cause I think it's really important. I think number one, you've got to have a boatload of wealth of philosophies and things that you've studied. You got to put in your 10,000 hours, know what's going on, know your value, know your skills, know where, you know, where you're at. When you do a business plan, you've got to do a lot of market research and competitive analysis, right? So you got to know where you're at in the market as a whole. It's not just like you just come out out of nowhere, like, like, duh, 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 I'm, I'm <laughs> random. Uh, there's a time and a place, I think, when that makes sense. Um, as far as inspiration engineers, like as far as other people becoming inspiration engineers, I, I do see the title where people are like, I'm an inspiration engineer too. Like that's what, you know, leadership can do. Right. For sure. But as of now I'm the only, only one. And so I just, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it wasn't built for the cool factor, even though I appreciate you saying it was cool. It wasn't, <laughs> like, I need a cool name. It was right. like, I need a name that doesn't put me in this damn box. Yeah. And I need a name where it makes sense. And so, you know, the engineer from the audio engineer, the yeah. inspiration ties in the music, the coaching, the content, this market, because it's all creative, right? It's all yeah. inspirational to some extent. So, like I said, it's not just some random words that I just chose. I just want to make For sure. sure. Yeah, <laughs> no, <laughs> I get it. Um, so just like this is going to, this could be a, a spiral of a question, but just so I can know and people out there can, can kind of just on a base level understand what you do. On like a spark notes version can you just say like in a, on, in a given week like what are the, the things you're working on i know you got like yeah, consulting and you're i just want i just want to just so i know just before we the, go the forward just that, so yeah I, yeah my my expertise revolves around personal branding right so personal branding involves sales marketing and media that's what majority of people really come to me for is okay. how do i brand myself or how do I market myself? It still ties into branding. So on the coaching side, um, you said consulting, which they're basically kind of one and the same. One is a done for you model. One is me tell you how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but it involves usually one of those three things, right? Now, every now and then I'll get some kind of random request like, hey, could you make a beat for my, uh, <laughs> for my podcast, right? I'll get those requests and I'll do them if I, if I had the time to do them. Uh, we are now at a place where in the marketplace, we want to put out the same type of content so people know like, okay, he's a personal brand like specialist, like that's what he does. And that content is not out there as much as it needs to be. Um, which is, like I said, I'm, I'm still on the journey too, guys. Like I'm not like there, like, okay, I've made it. Like I'm still building it as well. Yeah. Um, but then, and then the motivation music. So those are the mm -hmm. two things that we will be known for. And then we'll build off of that. So I okay. just want to say too, like when you look at when you said, I, I used two of the biggest names I, I did for a reason that was intentional. That was, yeah. there was no ego to that. That was intentional. So yeah. if you look at all the things that Tony offers, they don't all fall under the same category unless we say psychology. I mean, yes. maybe psychology would be the major umbrella. But he yeah. does dating and relationships. He does wealth and business. He does projects and systems. Yeah. He does venture capital. So yeah. again, if you if you look at a micro VC like a you know Barbara Corcoran or Damon John or Mark Cuban, those dudes and guys and gals are working on five hundred so hundreds of billion uh, businesses. So you've got to have a lot of different skills. So again, you don't have to be in this. What is the one thing you do? Uh, you do using my experience and failures. I will tell you this: you 
do want to systemize and funnelize one skill at a time. So if it's your podcast and public speaking, build systems and products under that one thing first mm -hmm. before you jump to the next skill. And, and now you're like, you've got all these skills, but it's not a full funnel for yeah. that one thing. So that's what I've learned over time, but hopefully that, that makes sense. Yeah, no, for sure. I've heard that's, I think that's great advice too. Cause like even as people are looking to make change in their lives or start something like it's always overwhelming. If you look at a, you know, a task that says like, improve myself. It's like, well, there's 5 million things that go under that bucket. So let's pick, let's pick diet. Let's pick what I'm putting into my body and then let's perfect that and do that for 60 days. Now let's add in mental, you know? And so I like, cause like when you look at the whole picture, sometimes it just gets like, it's overwhelming. So, so you work well, with a ton of, here's one, here's one more thing though. Yeah, now, I like to use a lot of philosophy just so that everybody's riding with me. Like, okay, he knows what the fuck he's talking about. Like, <laughs> so you've got Dennis Rodman since we were talking about basketball, Dennis Rodman, for those that know the Chicago bulls, he's a rebounder. That's all he does. Rebound, rebound, rebound. Right. Then you got Draymond Green. He's an all around player. He doesn't do one thing with a specialty. So you definitely have people in the marketplace that are specialists, which is cool. And if you want to be a specialist, that's where that 10,000 hours needs to come into play. That's where you need to have mastery. You need to just consistently focus on that one skill. Then you've got people that got diverse gifts and talents. And if you want to use those diverse and diverse gifts and talents to diversify your brand, why not? Mm -hmm. Why not? It's don't feel you have of the world. to do. Yeah. Don't feel you have to be just one thing. I'm just sure. saying from my experience, don't try to do it all at once because then the marketplace will be confused. For sure. Gotcha. 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 Okay. So, uh, I want some general piece of advice then for, for someone like me or anybody else out there. Like you work with a lot of entrepreneurs, dream chasers, uh, you know, people who are pursuing uh, a life of growth, you know, as people go on these journeys, like, do you have any just like top pieces of advice that you just kind of usually as like your baseline that you'll throw yeah. these people saying like, here's, here's one, two, and three. Like, don't, yeah. don't forget these three things. Absolutely. Number one, learn how to meditate, learn how to breathe. The practice of breathing and meditation is a game changer, like understanding how to think really, right? And control, and I use that loosely, control your thoughts. Right. So meditation and breathing can do that. Number two, journal definitely want to keep some kind of journal or ongoing log of activity right number three i recommend everybody do this skill stack all right i have a skill stack so in college or in uni if you're international and you're listening to this <laughs> they call that prerequisites you got to have this class to go into that class right right so my prerequisites of life. Oh, I think that's what I'm going to call it. The prerequisites of life. There we go. Uh, so <laughs> number one is master public speaking. Because if you master public speaking, and I'm going to give you the three skills in this order. Master public speaking, 75% of the market would rather die than public speak. So you are already in the top 25% by mastering that skill, which mm -hmm. is very uh, tough for a lot of people. So being able to get in front of an audience, be witty and speak uh, you know, fluently, in, in whatever languages you pick. So that's number one. Number two, if you learn how to speak, then the next one to add on to that is sales because sales is really, it applies first off to all industries and it's a simple skill, meaning that it's really all about asking the right questions at the right times. And we're all salesmen and women, whether we're trying to get our girlfriend or our boyfriend or spouse to go to a restaurant or we're trying to get our kids <laughs> to go to a certain college, every single person is a salesperson. So you might as well master sales, right? Mm -hmm. And then that third skill, because this is all ties into my number three, right. uh, is marketing, because it applies to all industries, right? Name an industry that doesn't need marketing. So if you don't learn how to master marketing, which is mass communication of sales, yeah, <laughs> those three go ahead and ahead. So those would be the three uh, pieces of advice I would give. For sure, listeners. for sure. You know, I studied marketing in school and like, I remember when I talked to people who weren't business majors, they're like, so why marketing? Like, what are you going to, like, people have such a, a generalized view of, of like selling products and, and, you know, retail and, and these sort of things. And I'm like, marketing is like, in my opinion, the ultimate tool. Like if you have a good idea or if you have a message or if you have something really important to you, you want to share to the world, 
marketing, man. <laughs> marketing. Crappy product sell, guys and gals. <laughs> Crappy product sell. So, and hopefully yeah, some of the good ones. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you always want to put out a good product, but I mean, if, if crappy products can sell you, that tells you how powerful marketing can be. For sure, for sure, for sure. Well, um, man, all right. We got, we got about 10, 15 minutes left here. I want to I wanna dig into a personal story. I feel like I want to get a little bit of a backstory behind you that maybe you don't talk about a lot. Maybe some okay. personal thing that you went through that was a, a struggle that built you into the person you are today. Uh, something like real life experience that, that kind of taught you something, made you a man a little bit. Mm. You share something like that with us? Yeah. So in 2005, like my parents, uh, a lot of times when I talk about my parents on these podcasts, I feel like I'm shaming my parents. And what I learned about my parents and any people for that matter People, not all people, first off, have the same love language. So you yeah. want to understand what kind of love language someone speaks. Not everybody has the same type of processing and brain operating system, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different like uh, behavioral assessment uh, tools out there to help you figure out how you think and For how sure. you process, right? Which is really important to know how your family and your inner circle process and communicate and all that jazz, right? So 2006, my, my, my parents were great parents compared to what they had like my my grandfather on my dad's side was not in my dad's life right so for that whole entire time for a long period of time and maybe like within four years ago like it wasn't that long ago I finally started to appreciate my dad because I started to understand his story and how he was raised which gave me better insight like man my dad's a beast yeah. but when it came to when it came to how he was raised from that that's where I say he was a beast when it came to mentorship coaching and and having a son that was an entrepreneur that he could help he sucked like absolutely sucked so I say that respectfully to him that just because a parent or a friend or a cousin or a brother or a sister or whatever just because somebody isn't great in where you would like them to be great doesn't mean that they a can't be great somewhere else and so my parents kept trying to feed me money on stuff that like, you know, me and my mom, we would spend quality time at like dances and things like that. Like this is like high school, but you know, we would, my mom would drop 300, $500 on a suit. Like let's go out and like ball out and get these like really fancy like pimp suits. Right. And so there was that time where I didn't appreciate at the time the value of, of, of what I was getting monetarily. So I was raised basically as a spoiled brat. Uh, very entitled, which millennials get. I'm I'm an older millennial guy, so don't 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 uh, knock me. But I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm still under the millennial umbrella. So they talk about how millennials supposedly are are more entitled than more people. But I was very entitled, so I didn't really understand, you know, money, and I didn't understand like where they were, like showing a lot of love. I was just seeing this. You don't support my dreams. You don't support my dreams. You don't support my dreams. Enemy, right? Mm -hmm. And so that was huge for me. And I think that. It, it took a lot of humility and it took a lot of um, like I lived on you talk about story I was homeless and I was like you know sleeping under a bridge uh, in Austin Texas like in the wintry cold it was so bad so bad but it was then that I was like man I really appreciate everything that I had being raised middle class and and you know some as they say somebody always has it worse and I hate when they say that with when they say <laughs> when you're with I mean I hate when they say that because it not only is it true but it's like when you're in a element of suffering for you that's relative suffering it's it sucks it's suffering so like it's like I don't want to be compared to I know somebody's got it worse but right now whatever I'm going through sucks like this is what it is so yeah. that in itself taught me you know the the I don't have kids, so I can't say like, you know, um, parenting wise, I had that kind of uh, evolutional, you know, mindset, mindset perspective shift. But I did have a shift when it came to the living so rough and, you know, sleeping in my car and living in like being in a homeless shelter and being under that bridge where I was like, man, like I really didn't have it that bad. Yeah. And that's what I say. Everything is perspective. And that was what started to challenge those perspectives with some of the tougher uh, yeah. situations that yeah. I lived in thereafter. Yeah. It's like the, the first time in your life, you didn't have the base, the base needs and, and luxuries that you had your entire life. And, and now, now you started to understand how much those meant to you. You know, it just, you had that moment of awakening. 
uh, man, well, I got I mean, I got a follow up question there. How, what well, yeah. the, the experience of, of homeless shelters and living in your car, I didn't see that coming. So I, I, now I'm processing, but what, I mean, what was that? Like, what was that like? And how did you get, how did you get yourself out of that? What was, I mean, how'd you, <laughs> I mean, it, this is, I, I didn't see there, this, this there's, part of the story coming into play. Yeah, there is a, I mean, I really don't know, you know, how to, how to describe it other than it was miserable. It was awful. It was the worst time in my life. Um, and you know, by comparison, I wasn't eating out of trash cans though. You know, Eric Thomas says he was eating out of trash cans. I didn't have to do that. Yeah. Like, that's bad. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it can be worse. I think that, so when you talk about how do you get yourself out of the darkness, number one, understand that it's temporary and it will pass even though it sucks while you're there. Number two, it's really, you have to understand that it's a test, right? So I am a Christian entrepreneur, so I got to drop scripture on, on our listeners. Romans 5.3, and I actually just posted one today. Hold up, I got to figure out the one that I just shared today, because the day I was like, oh man, that's, that ties into that one. Uh, duh, 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 give me one second, guys, sorry. James 1.2. So God tells us in both of those scriptures that suffering is a part of the process. It's a mm -hmm. part of the process because it develops the character. Matter of fact, I'm going to pull up Romans 5, 3 so that I can give you the actual formula. And when I, when I, <clears throat> when I had, when I had read that formula and I was like, Oh, okay, this is a part of it. This is to see it really, it, it weeds out who really wants this, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, do you really want this or not? And are you going to, or are you willing to, Continue going forward, or are you going to quit? That's really what it what it, what it comes down to. So Romans five three, he says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. And here comes the formula: because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope, and hope does not put us to shame. Now there's more there, but I'm going to stop there because mm -hmm. that ties into the whole scripture where he says, "I will not leave you nor forsake you." So it's one, uh, it's an opportunity for you to become close with the creator uh, because that's who you rely on in those times. Uh, mm -hmm. Miracles happen and things that blow your mind happen at that same time. Yeah. And there's these, there's these moments of beauty. But if I'm being just straight real with you and you know I am, you know I got to keep it 3,000%. It sucks, bro. I mean, it's, 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 it's rough. And I used to say, man, I wish nobody would go through that. Um, but now I hope everybody goes through that. Hmm. And you say, well, why? Because it's going to develop your character. You yeah. will change as a man or a woman. You will look at being homeless differently or the poor people differently. You, I mean, there's just so many different elements to who you are that will change how you think. Yeah. And for that reason, I hope everybody experiences suffering in a way that is meant for them. Yeah. Yeah, man. Wow. <sighs> Dude, that's real. That's so real. I mean... Yeah. I don't have much to to follow up and say off that. I feel like you covered all of it, but just the fact that, you know, the, the stuff you go through, right. That's, I feel like that's how you can really find joy in all parts of your life. Right. If you can really, really understand that this suffering or whatever you're going through, if you just keep going, eventually that's going to be like your superpower. That's going to be your perspective shift. That's going to be the message that you spread to thousands of people. That's going to be, you know, your, your badge of honor. That's going to like, you know, that's going to be your thing. And all these things only allows us to be more capable of being compassionate humans, empathetic humans, loving humans. Like it's all, it's like you said, I love what you said, God's testing you. He's saying, can you handle this? And if you can, then I'm going to give you a lot of responsibility to, to, you know, go out and, and spread the word. So man, you want, a, you want a mouth drop story? Yeah, dude. I know we're, I know we're approaching over time, but. Since, hey, let's, let's hear it, man. We're on a roll. Let's hear it. We're on a roll. Yeah. I feel like that too. I'm like, let's share it. So <clears throat> I was to go on a Facebook group interview called Living With Passion. I had never experienced uh, weeping. I was very blessed in my life. Nobody close to me that I knew had ever passed. Like people that I knew, yeah, they passed, but. I mean, they weren't like close, you know, family or friends or anything like that. So three hours prior to going on this show, living with passion, talking about a passionate life, my non biological he's my little brother, but he's not biologically related to me. I've known the kid for 10 years. He gets ran over walking across the street. 
Now, I don't mean like, you know, hit in a car. I'm talking about he's literally walking. He's drunk. I'm being stupid, but he's drunk and he's walking across the street and somebody does a hit and run, leaves him for dead. And when you experience that kind of experience, right, changes everything, changes everything. And, you know, luckily I was able to hold it together emotionally to still go on that show and, and deliver. But this is what it is. You know, Arnold Schwarzenegger talks about his dad passing while he uh, was training to be um, Mr. Olympia, right? Um, his dad passed during, and he said, I couldn't even process that information because I had to train, right? David Goggins talks about building up his body and mind so strong to where nothing can break through. And you have to understand that that's what the pain does. Now, you know, gratefully and everything, it was a miracle because I was present when Dustin, my little brother, walked without his, his cane three months, four months after the accident which he should have been dead. He got hit at 45, 55 miles per hour. So I say all that to say, hmm. the journey is going to put you through the ringer, right? Yeah. It's going to be a roller coaster of emotions, but that I wanted to share a positive story as well. Like, cause that happened during that whole span. And so you'll see the good, you'll see the bad, you'll see the light, you'll see the darkness. And it's all a part of molding you into who you, who you're to be. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, man. Wow. Yeah. Wow. All right. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to leave you with, uh, I want you to share what your definition uh, of an extraordinary life is with the listeners before we, before we sign off here. If you choose to live an extraordinary life, it's going to be a roller coaster. <laughs> it's going to be a roller coaster. You will have amazing stories because you will be tested. As they say, no test, no testimony. <laughs> the greater the vision, the greater the suffering. If you want to be that person that we, you know, we name dropped a lot of people in the show today. If you want to be any one of these guys or these gals and you want to be something to be remembered or build a legacy, just know that having an extraordinary life, it is worth it. I wouldn't trade none of that pain in. I wouldn't trade not a, not a day, not a minute because it all helped me become who I am. So if you want to live an extraordinary life, I challenge you to continue going for it. I challenge you to continue studying for it, preparing for it mentally, physically, spiritually, emotionally. And at mm. the end of the day, no matter what anybody says, you can do it. All right, everyone, that's all we got with inspiration engineer Ka Vey. The call to action I have from this interview has to do with identity because we talked a lot about that, right? Kaveh made this personal brand for himself and, you know, you don't have to do that, obviously, but he talked a lot about studying the greats and studying people who you want to be like, taking those good elements and then making it your own. And so my call to action would be make a list of three people out in the world who you want to be like, who you admire and find a way to study them find a way to figure out how you can take some of their traits and make them your own because that's the first step to fully embodying who you are as an individual and becoming the person that you want to become. So that's my call to action. Hope you enjoyed this interview with Ka Ve, Inspiration Engineer. With that being said, go make your dreams a reality and I will see you next time.